John O. McNeil, welcome back to the Singing Teachers Talk podcast. How are you, you very busy bee? <laughs> I am a very busy bee at the moment, I have to confess. And actually, you've been amazingly flexible with me trying to uh, find a time for this. I've, I think I've moved it twice on you, but, but no, I'm really happy to be here and um, always a pleasure to have anything to do with BAST. I think it's such an amazing organisation you guys have got going on. So this is a real pleasure. Oh, thank you so much for saying that. I mean, you have got an eclectic mix of training and experience under your belt. I mean, you've trained as a classical instrumentalist, you've studied as a jazz musician, you've been involved in session singing, singing backup for the likes of Michael Bublé, you create your own music as an artist, and you have worked as a vocal coach in institutions, in a private setting, and also on TV. So how has all of this informed you best as a voice teacher? And what's one of the life lessons that you've taken away from this? Well, it's actually quite interesting to hear you kind of crystallize it all like that, because there are, I, it make, make, makes me so aware of all the different chapters to what I guess I've kind of explored. And I think it's probably very much pointing to my very distractible brain. <laughs> I don't like to do anything too long for one thing for too long. But anyway, I think I really love every single one of those things I've been able to be involved with. And I think it's just a, a, a matter of just loads of enthusiasms. I think the core of them all is music. I love music. I can't stop listening to it. It's playing all the time, all sorts of different genres around my, my house, like to this day. And, and that's sometimes you know, a bit overwhelming when you're listening to it for your day job. But I just love what it does. I kind of love it almost from a slightly more kind of community-based perspective, you know, what it does to kind of capture our human experiences and what it does to crystallize different eras of us as a as a people and popular culture and youth culture and all those kinds of things. So I think that's that's been really kind of the core of it all. And whatever gets me in those kinds of doors is a good thing. But yeah, I think I had unmusical parents really. They didn't know really what they were interested in musically and so they just kind of saw a musical kid and they just kind of allowed me to to explore it all which is great and just happened to st stumble upon some really good mentors and teachers that kind of fueled that passion but yeah I I think that's kind of led down various different kind of pathways the artist pathway I guess was an interesting one for me I'd done a year of education studies at university at, as an 18 year old and then saw an audition poster for a band an established band and just kind of ran away with them much to my parents dismay but I it just meant I was kind of having a bit of a baptism of fire touring recording you know just these big crowds working out what to do with them and all that kind of stuff so it was kind of a bit of a bandstand education as we called it back in Australia and then you know I guess that kind of funneled me back into academia I wanted to plug some holes that I felt that were needing to be plugged knowledge wise and and that was great I think I kind of found new passions in jazz um, and the kind of approach to jazz. I think probably the approach to learning jazz and developing jazz has probably inform, informed a lot of my perspectives as to how I approach music now. I'm very much a pop guy now. I That's my very much my niche. But I think jazz was responsible for really framing that all. But in amongst that, I've talked about my parents a bit, but they're both teachers. I think I've got an educator in me this kind of almost by default so I think there is a a real desire in me to kind of see the education that's been bestowed on me by amazing people I'm really kind of distributed about the anyone that I get contact with and that took me to the institutions that I've been able to teach at um I love you know I teach people in this space right here um artists groups all sorts um and I just love I guess to kind of cast vision for what music can do give people the skills that they need to really express what is within them. You know, I think music is primarily about self-expression. So those skills or those techniques need to be the vehicle to make that happen. A parenthesis, I always say that technique is a wonderful servant and a terrible master. I think when that becomes the whole focus technique, we definitely lose the soul of what music's about. So I do kind of do it in that respect. But yeah, and then the TV thing, gosh, that was a surprise that I think I'm probably set out into my musical career with no idea that TV coaching even existed. Um, and I was just kind of asked to help on some auditions on The Voice. Um, gosh, it's probably nearly 
a decade ago or, or even over. I'm not really good with chronology, but I I just kind of mucked in, did it. I was quite intimidated by the whole thing, full disclosure. But I just, I think there was something about getting people to a high level on speed, like at a, at a really high rate, which which I was quite attracted to. And I think it really put some pressure on my skills to really get people with very obvious and exciting change in very short space of time. And I loved that pressure. I think I've always thrived under pressure. And that, that's been something I, I've now found a real kind of home in. I you know, now work on several TV shows. Now it's The Voice, The Voice Kids and The Masked Singer are kind of my staples, but I do other shows around that and the odd pilot here and there <laughs> sometimes doesn't do very well, <laughs> but yes. And I guess I, I've come maybe full circle now where I'm doing much more industry, music industry stuff. So I'm working particularly with groups, a couple of boy bands and a girl band, are my main focus, and really kind of moving more into studio work, vocal production, arranging. And I guess it's put me back on that kind of creative bent, which I, I absolutely need to be in because I'm kind of, helping to create a real sound that is not only current, but kind of pushing the envelope, you know, kind of doing things that I feel or believe people will respond to, even though it has not really come into its fruition at that point, which I guess is the definition of creating, you know, or, cre or being a creator, you're taking something that hasn't been formed and, and giving it some life. So how did the TV opportunities actually arise for you? It was a bit of networking. I had some people who had seen what I do and thought that I would be a good fit. That said, I feel like in TV in those early years, you're always being auditioned as far as being even, you know, they call it talent in the in that kind of ecosystem. But you're always being, I guess, reviewed by execs and you know, producers and everyone's always watching you to see what you're doing with the with the acts that are going to be performing and try to see if you're the right fit for that. And then after a while, I think I just got my flow with it and managed to kind of keep my job for long enough for that to be seen and, and acknowledged. I, I can kind of remember a moment where I just I just started to click in with the whole thing. I just thought, this is really me. I love being on a TV set. I love being with these kind of really amazing kind of 90 second performances that need to kind of grab your heart within you know, 30 seconds of those. And I love, you know, seeing the reactions of the audience. And I love trying to work out how to pull a heartstring and how to draw the best out of someone that maybe haven't, hasn't sung at all, you know, in a professional sense, and certainly not, you know, in front of 18 cameras to, you know, three to 7 million people, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a whole different psychological game. And I just loved every bit of it. I also love TV people with like, you know, they're good fun people to be around. Everyone's kind of mucked in to make the job happen. Everyone's under pressure, but you just, you're a, a cog in a big machine that you just really, you have to trust that everyone's doing their job to the highest level and to the best of their ability. And you kind of, yeah, you just muck in and make it work. But the, that's how I kind of got into it. But yeah, job retention is 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 a, is a whole other discussion. <laughs> Uh, but I'm very lucky to be able to, uh, being st able to stay in these TV shows for so long because, yeah, it's a really exciting place to be. It's a good job that you thrive under pressure because it sounds bloody stressful. <laughs> yeah, and, oh gosh, and the days are long. You get kind of put into these kind of dark studios which don't have any kind of awareness of daylight <laughs> outside. and It can really start to mess with your head after a while. But I do like it. You kind of go into a zone when you're on these shows, you know, you kind of just disconnect yourself from the real world and you just, you just get on with it. I get to, I get into this, that very zone where you just kind of like, I'm just going to make it happen. And you know, there's reactions happening and there's people crumbling and there's wobbles happening right, left and center. And there's, you know, voices that, you know, need to be gotten to a place where they are fully functional and are able to do what they need to do in very short spaces of time. So you're applying technique, you're applying style, you're shaping the song, you're trying to come up with arrangements, you're working with the musical director, you're working with the execs, you're kind of the meat and the sandwich with lots of different people coming to talk to you, but then you're the access to the act, you're having to be up there calming them, you know, pressing, you know, 
pressing them at certain points, trying to make sure that they're kind of, I guess, delivering all they can, shaking and giving them a little bit of a pejorative slap around the face here and there, you know, like, you know, you just got to always be knowing where the job is all the time and then kind of snapping to action. But I think that's what I like about it. I, I really love people. I really I love interacting with people. I love understanding them and kind of reading them and working out how I can get the most out of them. And that's, I guess, really keyed into an enthusiasm there. So the pressure isn't too bad once you're finding that you're in your flow and you're doing something you enjoy. You did a really great masterclass for BAST called Working with Exceptional Kids, which is available, by the way, listeners, on the BAST membership. And in that, you explained the setup of The Voice Kids. So can you give us some further insight into the setup of something like The Masked Singer, if you're able to, and I'm not going to get you fired because there are really secretive parts of that show, aren't there? (laughs) Lots of NDAs we have to sign, you yes, but but no, I I'm happy to absolutely share what I can, and I think it's a a fascinating world to me. You know, I you know even though I've done it for a while, I I love to chat about it. In fact, I'm not sure where this when this podcast will go out, but the final of the Voice Kids is on Saturday on ITV. Uh, yes, yeah, so you might miss it by the time you if you're hearing this podcast. Um, but yeah, it's it's it really is fascinating because I think TV has to kind of capture audiences it has to you know really shows get commissioned based on ratings and yes new things come out and i think you know channels are great at being able to try new formats but really the ones that stick around are the ones that people want to watch and so trying to work out how to make that happen consistently i think is the challenge and so i guess with music entertainment shows like the voice and the mass singer it's about creating stories and relationships with the characters and the talent and the acts on 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 the screen that people feel like they can connect to and yes that can be done with vts and you know background about their jobs and their previous experiences or their highs and lows and all that kind of thing you know we all love to get to know an artist for sure their personal lives it's kind of the kind of fascination of fame as well that we have but i think beyond that in my area is the music bit I guess have to be able to see that musical element that will capture people where an artist is different, where an actor is different, where a kid is different and put them on show. For shows like The Voice and The Voice Kids, we do audition tens of thousands of people for those shows. And especially in the early days where we were really throwing the net out wide, you know, it might be, you know, 40, 50,000 people would be getting applications in there. So, you know, it, it's, it's become a bit more of a fine process now and we have amazing scouts and and kind of casting teams that are good at finding people. But yeah, there are just a huge amount of people. And so our job as vocal coaches, you know, alongside the team is to kind of extract someone we feel like are really going to strike that chord in the public, you know, and it might be a diamond in the rough. You know, a lot of the time it is. And sometimes that, super polished, technically proficient, highly experienced singer is not as emotive or maybe doesn't capture someone's heart or bring that kind of sense of something extra to the table. And and so, yeah, I guess one of the things that I think this is perhaps vocal coaching as a, as a wider thing, but I think one of the main jobs that we do is giving artists, singers, acts a vision for themselves that is much bigger than they have for themselves. Um, and I think you've got to do that quite quickly. You know, all of this happens at speed. You've got to be able to say, no, this is your time. You've got this. And I think we can get you there and they have to trust you. So that building of trust is a big thing as well. Yeah, you know, especially, you know, a lot of these shows, people are quite suspicious. So, <laughs> you know, are you going to sabotage me? Or do you, you have a, like, a, are you favoring the person in the room next door? Or, you know, all these kinds of things. So you've got to show that, you know, and actually really be on their side you know, it can't just be an act you know, you've got to really be on the side of the act I often call us vocal coaches we're like the soldiers the act soldiers you know kind of protecting them quality, quality control making sure they've got everything they need making sure that their performance is going to be everything they hoped and dreamed of we're the one kind of fighting for them in that process especially amongst all the pressure that they have to go through so yeah and then and then I guess you know these shows yeah, you know they're Sometimes they, from casting, from the beginning of your casting process through to 
broadcast can be over 12 months. And so you, you're very much kind of monitoring them over those times. I mean, along with big teams, we've got amazing kind of casting teams and pastoral teams. And, you know, we get psychologists involved, you know, to make sure that, you know, the acts are able to manage the process. It's really, really important. We've got duty of care and the whole thing as well, and welfare and all that kind of stuff. So that's all taken into account. So we're part of that team, but definitely involved in that whole process. And then you've got to get them onto stage. You, this is one of my main jobs is putting people on stage and making sure that they, one of the, probably the biggest phrases I say, just before someone walks onto stage is do what we've planned because so it's easy to go rogue with all that kind of adrenaline, all that excitement around you and that screaming audience and all those cameras and all that kind of, you know, hype and you can go rogue, but you know, I guess it's really, really important for us to prepare something that we know is going to work and then execute it the way that we have planned. And that means that there's a quality that can be there as well. Yeah. I, I don't know. There's, there's so much to that. I, I can walk all about this stuff. So, um, so do you stop me, but there's a little bit of a nutshell of stuff involved with that I don't know if that helps yeah yeah for sure and you mentioned this big team how much of that includes collaborating with judges so like on the voice if you've got pixie lot there and will I am how much of that is communication with them to what they've commented on or what they see as as teams so an interesting thing with the voice formats is that people in the red chairs, the celebs are called coaches. And so we, you know, people that do the singing coaching, we're called vocal coaches on the show and we're behind the scenes. And then the red chairs are the celebrity coaches. Uh, and so they are really by definition and by name need to be involved with the creative process. They can't just be picking people and, you know, hoping for the best. So they, and they do love to be involved, you know, for sure. I think they've got that vested interest, obviously, in their teams. They want their teams to win and do really well. They want someone within their team to win the show. So there is that motivation there for them. And a lot of the time, yes, they're giving us notes, us vocal coaches notes, You know, especially if they want a little energy kind of bump or might be in song choices or it might be that something they're concerned about. And sometimes they'll even dive in for things like keys and things like that. Yeah, and then you know, the vocal coaches then will go away and we'll do a lot of that implementation for the for the act beyond that. Yeah, I guess, you know, it's always nice to have as few notes as, as you can get. That's always like a little personal challenge I give myself. I wonder how far I can get this completely over the line, you know, and and and, and have people just go, Wow, bravo, fantastic. I don't have any notes. <laughs> That's just a little kind of selfish uh, <laughs> little personal goal <laughs> but yeah but no I'm I'm a big collaborator I love teams I love being in big big highly competent teams where everyone's really good at their jobs and I'd much rather rather than that than be some sort of you know lone ranger so uh, on with my own kind of renegade crusade going on <laughs> how do you help celebrity contestants on something like the masked singer who may never have sung a note in their life or have never done anything like this before? Well, I guess you treat anyone in these kinds of shows the same. You you work, work out where they are at and you help them from that point. Yeah, we we teach singing. And, and I think this is where I kind of come back to some of my roots. You know, at the end of the day, you kind of use your experience, your musical intuition, your soul, your musical soul, like what kind of triggers you, what excites you, what makes you bored, and use those things to kind of work out where the holes are. And then you just start filling those in for the the individual that's in front of you. And I think this is, you know, this is not peculiar to any one show. This is probably the process for every 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 person that I teach singing. And yeah, I think I think again like I say, I think there's this sense of giving someone a vision for what they could do that maybe is even bigger than what they have for themselves. Sometimes there's that. And then sometimes I have this kind of philosophy of, of high-low, which is when you get a high-impact performance, which just really arrests the senses, but is also low on demand when it comes to the actual mechanical 
outworking of that, maybe something that doesn't kind of stretch someone so far that they're you know putting a lot of risk on the line. And sometimes, yeah, try to find that can be in song choices, that can be in decisions to how you shape the song, where those ad libs go, for how far you take them, all that kind of stuff. But sometimes there's real merit in going to a place of comfort for that singer and finding the place for that singer to be as comfortable as possible so they can just do something they're really, really proud of and not be put in too much harm's way. There's sometimes that is needed. Also, you still want impact. You know, this is still about having a really exciting performance from everyone. But yeah, I try not to, to, to put needless risk into a performance, whether it be musical or technical. So yeah, sometimes it's just kind of executing that little bit of wisdom at that particular moment. But yeah, I guess as you know, as you know, I can't speak too much about masking it just due to the constraints on our privacy for the show. But I guess the big, the main challenge, as anyone could imagine, is singing in a mask and being anonymous, having these amazing costumes on you that completely take away your identity, and that also can be heavy and can be warm and can be almost disconnecting from the real world as well. And, you know, we have amazing teams that make them as comfortable as possible, but there's a lot of psychology behind all of that that can really be something to navigate for the act. Can that sometimes be quite a positive thing? If you've got a singer who is actually quite frightened of this experience, stepping into that costume and they are amazing and they do they do look heavy but as you say the the team probably makes them as as easy as possible but do you feel like that sort of ta- taking away their own identity can help with things like performance anxiety or, or nervousness or does it heighten it yeah i think i think for a lot of singers there they will see themselves in one of two categories anyway more live or more studio. And and I think it's probably the same for that for that concept of having a mask. You know, the studio, you don't have to put on a face of makeup, you don't have to, you know, wear anything particularly, you don't have, you know, goggling eyes on you, you know, audiences that have all these high expectations. You also don't have to do things in one take. And and so a lot of singers will feel a great sense of comfort in the recording studio that they that allows them to do their best and then Conversely, you get the live people who won't perform their best unless they've got all that adrenalized crowd around them. But I think it's probably similar to wearing a mask, you know, being behind a veil. For some, yes, it will be very empowering. For some, they'll want to kind of burst out of that shell and connect more with people and create more eye contact and more connection, all that kind of stuff. So personality base for sure. But yeah, I think, yeah, it's something I wish I could talk, talk much more on just because there is a, there is a lot to being in a mask but yeah just the nature of the show that 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 stuff needs to be a little bit private yeah and you know what i can't actually cope with the fact that you know (laughs) you you know right now like Uh, your mind you know and i have no idea i can't cope with that um i will keep it all i i i yeah i am not great with secrets so being on that show has been a really great new discipline for me to exercise uh, just biting been... your knuckles each time that's it that's it any executive producers of the show listening i have been really good yeah i, I know nothing <laughs> uh, what qualities do you think a voice teacher working on a tv show needs to have so many really i think Probably the top two would be having loads of experience because you have loads of different situations thrown at you right, left and centre. So I think that might require interpersonal skills through to vocal technique and lots of different vocal technique things you can do really quickly. Musical intuition, trust in your instincts, ability to sell an idea, all those kinds of things. So so that that's, I guess, under the big umbrella of experience lots and lots of it just being around lots of singers I think is really really helpful in that situation and then secondly I think you need to be amazing at being in a team and it's something that I love so this is why I feel TV fits me so well I do actually prefer being in a big old team where everyone knows what they're doing and everyone's good at what they're doing and and you can just trust that everyone's doing their bit and we have you know in TV you've got editorial production and crew and I'm kind of in editorial 
and production make sure that we all run really really smoothly and we're to schedule and everyone gets there on time and you know that you know all the things arrive when they need to and get the sets built on time and but us at Toyo, like we're the creators the vision people you know and and we we can't do without the other you know that we can't have one without the other and of course crew executed all with cameras and lighting and sound and all that kind of stuff but yeah so i think you need to be able to work in those teams really really well and you need to be able to get on with people i think it's really really important you're not gonna have a nice time if you don't get along with people in tv but i think that means that so first if you can trust others but also be trusted yourself it means that you don't provide a burden for anyone else and everyone else can do their jobs better because they're not having to worry about what john is doing with the singer you know what i mean so there's a bit of there's a bit of that going on and i i think i think it, probably intuition would have to be way up there i guess let's make it top three you need to be able to read a room read a person understand what people want and i think if you're not asking that question you get into yourself into a lot of trouble you know, if you get a, an act walking into the room that that wants something different to what you want for them, that can create some real dissonance and real tension, and and that you know can mean that they aren't having a good time, that they are not able to do what they want to do, what they came to the show to do. And it's amazing seeing once you can reflect back to the act, whoever you're with, what you believe they are wanting for themselves. You see their shoulders just let go and you see them relax and calm down and start to smile again and start to kind of settle into the space and then you can really do much more work with them because they are in a place of comfort and safety and they know that they can trust you. And that means the world to me. You know, when someone trusts me, I never take that for granted. So yeah, that's that they're probably my top three things. Yeah, you have to be reactive, adaptable, changing all the time. You've got to be fast on your feet. You've got to know when to press the red button. You know, when like there's an emergency, like you need to know when to when something's a disaster. You also need to not catastrophize and always be problem solving as well. You know, work out how you can get through this particular situation. You need to know when to ask for help. You need to know when to get... I mean, one of the things I love is that I work with dear friends of mine. So other the other coaches that I work with, you know, I'm at their houses having dinner and like, you know, we're really close. And so we can all kind of, we all know our strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes we you know, jump into the room next door and go, all right, Jay, well, what do you think? I think this is, you know, this is slightly out of sync, but I'm not quite sure why. And there's a bit of a disconnect there. And she might have an insight that might help me, you know, with that kind of moment. So there's a bit of a collegiate, collaborative approach, which I really love as well. Awesome. Um. From your experience, how do you see or how would you like to see the role of the TV coach evolve? Well, what a wonderful question and thank you for asking it. Maybe I'd like to comment on how new fresh faces can get into TV coaching. And granted, there are not a lot of spots, so I don't want to... <laughs> Um, be you know, cutting off my nose to swipe my face but but you know I would like to keep my job that said I do really believe also in the next generation and I think one of the disadvantages of TV is it can be really difficult to get into very closed doored it's very difficult to get those slots or those jobs so a again I don't want to keep myself out of my own work I love what I'm doing and I don't want to leave the job but I do think there could be a much more open doored approach to that world i think there are a place for interns you know apprenticeship like kind of positions where new great talented coaches can come in who are fresh faced and have great new ideas and could be a part of seeing the running of those kinds of shows and kind of being able to see how they can bring their value to those scenarios as well and i think Sometimes the thing that locks other people out of those positions is their lack of experience. And actually, you know, there's very little shows that are going to employ a vocal coach without, you know, a decent amount of TV experience. But how do you get that TV experience? And that's already always sorted in like editorial and production where you get runners and you can, you can become a researcher or assistant production, you know, production coordinator or production secretary. There's lots of different runs you can work up and you're seeing the the, the whole system works because you're seeing what's going on around you you're learning the ropes you're learning 
how to deal with all sorts of situations, you know, whether it be going to Sainsbury's and picking up a bag of shopping and then realizing that, you know, there's something going wrong with the order through to, you know, right at the top where you're working out how to deal with, you know, a big kind of political concern from the, from the show or something that's kind of happened that is, you know, not messaging the right stuff to the, to the general public. So I love that in the TV world. And I wish there was a bit more of that in the coaching world. I would have appreciated that so much. You know, I was definitely thrown to the walls a bit, you know, you just kind of muck in and do your best and prove yourself. But, you know, I've definitely had really kind, wonderful colleagues who have kind of nudged me here and there and said, it's all right to do that. It's all right to walk up there. It's all right to say that to that person. And how about you go to the exec and just suggest that and all those kinds of things that you're just like, ah, oh, <laughs> should I do it or shouldn't I? And that kind of stuff is really helpful. And maybe a bit more of that considering the next generation could be incorporated into the future of TV vocal coaches. Well, John McNeil, it's been a pleasure to chat with you. Where can people find out more about you and get in touch? Oh, well, always love to hear from anyone. I guess my main socials are Instagram. So it's just Instagram.com slash John McNeil, one N J O N O M C N E I L. And my website has a lot of information about what I do, a lot of my tutorials, artists that I work with, their videos and all sorts of things. So I'd love you to visit that. Again, that's Jono McNeil Ed. So J-O-N-O-M-C-N-E-I-L-E-D.com. I'm very impressed with myself that I managed to spell that all, all out. Thank you so much. We'll see you very soon. Doo-doo.